My name is Malcolm Bisbee. I've been interested in industrial history for many years and as a personal uh, initiative I've done extensive research into the story of the finding of a high grade form of ironstone in the Rosedale Valley and found it such a fascinating story I felt it would be worth sharing with others and I've made a series of uh, uh, four DVDs uh, from talks I've given at Village Halls. Talk three uh, will follow the track route in onto the eastern side of the Rosedale Valley, look at the structure of the uh, mining operation on the eastern side and then deal with the failure of the Rosedale and Ferry Hill Mining Company in 1879 and the following change of ownership and the changes that took place on the eastern side as a result of uh, the change in ownership. Now then, uh, part three, we're into the nitty gritty of the deposits that were discovered in 1853. And I've termed it the Great Rosedale Ironstone Robbery because um, initially the two people who made the discovery then approached some acquaintances of theirs and formed a group to exploit the find, negotiate purchase of, a, of the land um, and you know the mining royalty. It then originally started off with about nine shareholders. It then grew to 12 <laughs> and I'll read some extracts to you. It ended up at the end of the day, and this ironstone was valuable, valuable stuff. It was fetching twice or more the price of ordinary ironstone, and there was a lot of it, millions of tons of it. So there was a fortune there to be had. And one Machiavellian character, who we'll learn a bit more about this afternoon, he was the schemer and the plotter, and he ended up with the, the whole treasure, as it were, in the hands of three shareholders. So nine, including the two people who made the discovery, were done out. And what happened then, they went to the solicitors in Whitby, Panett and Gray, Gray and Panett, I think it was Gray and Panett, and you can imagine them saying, you know, we've been robbed, we want to bring a case. You can only imagine it because I have a, a manuscript document, a statement of facts taken down by this particular solicitor. He's listening to the story and he's writing down the notes. And you can imagine somebody says, oh, no, that's not right. And he crosses out and he writes. And I've got a copy of this and it takes some sorting out. And my wife typed it all up for me. In, in legible form, but still verbatim as, as it was recorded at the time, round about 1862-ish. And eventually, these cheated shareholders got some redress, only part, part redress, because they really got some compensation for the so-called magnetic ironstone but the Rosedale Mining Company, as it then became, with these three people who ended up in charge of it, um, expanded, of course, into the Rosedale Valley and, and the East Mines, and the East Mines became even more of a bigger proposition than the, the West Mines. So what we have is the discovery and then the scheming to... Uh, get rid of the people who'd made the discovery and, and, as it were, take the treasure in to themselves. Now, I'll read now from the document, just two or three paragraphs, it won't go on forever, but just to give you the flavour. This is on the solicitor's document. Discovered in April 19, 1853, by William Thompson and Matthew Snowden near Hollins Farm, Rosedale West Side. This is a magnetic ironstone deposits. First test results indicated an iron content of 60%. Original group formed to exploit were 
Messrs. Thompson, Snowden, Sheriff, R. Park, Wilson, Dawson, Hutchinson, G. Park, and Tyson. Now then, later joined by Trattles, Nags, and Isaac Hartas as the Estdale Ironstone Company. Now, the wolf is amongst the sheep now. Isaac Hartas is in on the shareholders. He's part of the scene. So, the second sample of stone is sent to Leeds for analysis, and it gave a poor result. Isaac Hartas begins to assume control and realises that this second sample was badly selected or tested and sends a further sample. The sample result comes back and it's fine. But Hartas doesn't tell the others. He leaves it as though the bad sample is still with everybody. That's what they've got in their mind. But he doesn't tell them the latest sample really says, confirms the original. Meanwhile, he conspires with Lehman and Sheriff to arrange for the transfer of the lease into the name of George Lehman. Now, this group of people had originally negotiated for the kitchen deposit royalty to come to them as the group, but Isaac Hartas now is scheming to get, get it out of their hands. Now, the important fact here is that George Lehman, who was a friend of Isaac Hartas, but wasn't one of these shareholders at the time, was at that time deputy chairman of the North Eastern Railway Company. Now, the North Eastern Railway Company were a rapidly expanding, became the most important railway in the North East. They, they, were, they were really dynamic and go ahead. And eventually, George Lehman becomes chairman. But he was the key because he could ensure if he was drawn into this plot and would benefit from it, financially benefit from it, he was the key because he had the influence to make sure that the railway came to Rosedale. Without the railway, this fine couldn't be exploited. They tried, they'd actually done some mining from 1856, leading stone out of this, this, these deposits by horse and cart. I mean, eight horses pulling a cart of ironstone, 10 miles to Pickering to load onto trains to ship out to Leeds and, at the time, uh, places like Middlesbrough. That changed later on. And when the railway finally got established and the mining operation started in scale then with the railway, shifting large tonnages, um, up to that point, by horse and cart, they'd moved 4,000 tonnes. Can you imagine? 4,000 tonnes by horse and cart with roads that weren't roads as we know them today. The roots were allegedly two feet deep and all the locals were complaining bitterly about this traffic in Einstone that was wrecking the roads. And each parish, of course, was responsible for the roads in their area and had to pay for them uh, and mend them themselves. So it wasn't a popular thing. But realistically, the only way to get this large tonnage of valuable ironstone out of Kildale, remote as it then was, and still is, I suppose, was to build a railway. So George Lehman was the key. And Isaac Hartas, being a friend of his, and of course said, leave it with me, I'll make sure we get the, we get the loot. So that set the scene. Now then, this is another extract from the solicitor's document. He's listening to the cheated shareholders, and he's getting the gist of what was going on. Hartas, pretending to be studying the interest only of his fellow shareholders in the Estdale Company, which company turned out to be an unfortunate speculation, those who invested in it, you know, had wasted the money, was constantly in communication with Lehman and Sheriff. Now, Sheriff was at one time a passenger manager for the North Eastern Railway Company, but he obviously had other interests as well. So he was involved, there was 
George Lehman, who was sitting out on the fence, as it were, not a shareholder, but secretly involved, and uh, Sheriff, who was a shareholder, and uh, Hartas is constantly in communication with Lehman and Sheriff on the subject of disposing of their interest in the Rosedale affair, which from unforeseen difficulties arising from the carriage of the ore did not seem very promising. This is the horse-drawn stuff, you know. Um, it, it, they couldn't handle a volume that was necessary. He repeatedly urged that matters should be left in his hands or all would be spoiled. In other words, you know, I'll get the loop, just leave it with me. He had much of his own way. He always managed to be chair of any meetings and he held meetings at short notice when he knew people couldn't attend. And, you know, this was the sort of way he operated. So resolutions and things were passed with minimal objection because it was inconvenient for all the shareholders to attend. He made sure of that and he made sure he was in the chair. Hence, he had much of his own way. He contrived by one pretext or another to throw his fellow shareholders overboard. And with Sheriff and Lehman to get hold of the whole concern and also Mr. Darley's royalty. Darley was a landowner on the West Bank side and there was Ironstone, of course, elsewhere like Sheriff Pitt. And they were negotiating with Darley as well. And having, through Lehman's influence, obtained a railway to the place, banked up, the concern promises to be immensely lucrative. So that sets the scene. We know now there's a schemer involved and he's going to end up with a loot for three of them. And, and that did happen. So we're at the point now where we reach bank top and we're going to descend down the incline because the deposits of magnetic ironstone were 400 feet below bank top. So they had to build an incline down to the mines. This really didn't get obviously accomplished and properly and running until the railway finally got finished and reached bank top in 1860, March 1861. Right, so this is the incline. Of course, over the years it's subsided it was a three foot gauge and its length was uh, just over half a mile in length. It was rope hauled, a stationary engine, steam driven obviously, a bank top hauled up the tubs, the rakes of uh, tubs of ironstone from the mines. Right, we'll get down to the mines. So this is a top shot of the first one, which is the kitchen deposit and you can see it's been largely excavated. I mean, it was so easy to get, it was quarried, but also it went deep, you'll see later, it, it went deep underground and they tunneled as well, drifts, drifts. But they were quarrying at the top. And at one stage, in the early stages, they reckon there were 200 miners crawling all over that. Now, that, particular area was only about three and a half to four acres in size and you can imagine 200 miners with tubs and, and tramways and gunner stores what it must have looked like a beehive here we see more evidence of the quarrying that was going on as well as the mine drifts so you know quite extensive quarrying altogether by the time both workings were finished in 1885. Something like three million tons have been taken out. We've gone down to floor level and we can see, I call it um, sort of marsh grass. There is a name for it. Somebody here will probably know what you, pro cooch grass and what marsh grass, whatever. Um, this stuff here. And you notice what, did I hear somebody say what it was? Sieves? Sieves. Sieves. Sieves, right, sieves. <laughs> um, now, when you see lines like this, straight lines with this type of grass growing, you can bet your bottom dollar there's been a tramway there into the hillside. And sure enough, 
that's the entrance to the drift. So they've quarried all this lot up here, and now they're going in to the workings. There was one up here as well in there. When I, I can't walk these days, but when I was able to do, I kicked around with my heel in that marshy, wet, soggy ground. And sure enough, you can see the sleeper chairs still there after about 150 years, still sitting there. So here was the tramway leading into the mine and tubs of ironstone, obviously, with the sleepers and the rails led out onto the marshalling area. Uh, this was a broken chair that I found lying around. You can see it's, it's uh, cracked in the weakest spot there. Um, these were castings, so they weren't, it wasn't steel, of course. In, at that time, there was hardly any steel being made up here. Now, this is the adjacent deposit called the Garbutt deposit. The name of the kitchen deposit is named after the solicitor who did the deal, but he was acting on behalf of a Mrs. Jane Spinks, who actually owned the land. And on her behalf, he negotiated the lease it, originally to the Estale Einstein Company. But of course, <laughs> that didn't last long. Then next to it was the Garbutt deposit, a uh, slightly smaller deposit. The two areas were probably seven acres in, in total. The mines were generally called at that time the Hollins Mines simply because Mr. Garbutt was a farmer and lived in that farmhouse there. And it's still there. And Mr. Garbutt was the one who sold the royalty, if sold the land, in fact, um, to, the, to the company, um, Lehman and Sheriff and uh, Hartus, of course. So that's hence the name Hollins Mines. This is a cross-section drawn on one of the mine maps and it gives you an idea of what these formations were like. The smaller one being the Garbutt deposit and the larger one was the kitchen deposit. Now, this was the sort of overburden, if you like. And then there was, a, there was Dogger Seam, the inferior quality ironstone that was extensively mined in the Rosedale Valley and actually was, was not bad. And it was mixed in with the so-called mag uh, magnetic ironstone. And this went quite deep. We were told that to imagine them as shaped like two rugby balls, that sort of rugby ball shape. And the thickest, the centre, was about 70 feet thick. And, of course, it went fairly deep, so there were drift workings below the level. Round here, they were quarrying, and then down here, they were drifting. It worked in earnest from 1861 to 1885, when virtually there wasn't much left, and that mining operation closed. But we'll, we'll come to all that, because there's a lot going on before 1885. So let's move on a bit. This is um, an outline. This is, a, I think, 1870 mining map. This shows the, the kitchen deposit, the shape of it. And this was the Garbutt deposit, a bit more elongated, but uh, narrower. The two lumps were separated by a shale band uh, between the two. Uh, they were effectively split. Perhaps at one stage, millions of years ago, they'd been together, but earth movement and whatever had changed that. Now you can see the working galleries. This is underground drift working galleries for both mines, quite extensive. Also in the surrounding area, there was the, the dogger, which was inevitably getting a little bit mixed in, but it didn't matter. The iron content of this material was so high. And here we see a, a magnetic stone with a, an ordinary fridge magnet on a clothes peg just to demonstrate how it attracts a magnet. Now then, um, let's get back to Mr. Hartas. He was a successful man already in that he owned uh, an iron foundry in the village of Relton near Pickering. 
he had some successful designs of kitchen ranges, which, you know, all houses in those days had these different designs of kitchen ranges, ovens that were heated by the fire and all sorts of shelves and arrangements. And his patterns, his designs were successful and he was, he was doing all right. Now, his property is still, still exists and um, the present owner, Mr. Eden Blythe, kindly allowed me to photograph it and explain some of the uh, areas. And uh, so let's go and explore around it. This area here was the sort of smelting area. We found clinker and evidence of that. Um, this was the outside area, would have a, some sort of a structure over it, of course. But uh, here they, they did the smelting of ironstone. And then this was the casting shop in here. And this was the smithy where they'd fashioned a pig iron uh, into various products. And this was the product that this foundry was making. This is a typical range. And in fact, it says on here, Relton Foundry. But this is the sort of thing that they were producing and he was doing all right. And when he finally did the uh, dirty on the rest of the shareholders and really started to make big money, he moved. And he moved, <laughs> he moved into this place here, uh, Relton Manor, which is still there, obviously. So he was living in style. But it's a bit of a mystery. We don't have a photograph of him. The sort of story peters out a bit. Now, because he made all this money, and he became very rich, he sort of uh, sponsored things like the local cricket club. And uh, he was well thought of in the district because he was quite a generous man with his, with his own people. And uh, it was well thought of in, in that respect. You know, he could be relied on to make a donation or help a cricket club or whatever. It's a bit of a mystery because he dabbled in the, in the stock market and it seems to fade out. We, we really don't know towards the end what happened. Eventually, the company, as we'll hear, ran into hard times and went bust. But I think he came up smelling roses. I don't think he lost a great, great deal of money. Anyway, it was necessary to explain all this to you because it, he was the key and his contact with George Lehman, with this influence with the Northeastern Railway, was the real driving force that got the railway established into Rosedale across the moors. I mean, it was an incredible feat. And um, we're able to exploit Rosedale, which became a very important contributor to Britain's industrial success. You know, um, we were a superpower in that period. And not least because of areas like Rosedale, which was supplying high-grade ironstone, the booming iron industry, and Britain in turn was the exporter to the world. At one stage, 90% of iron ships were built in Britain. You know, it was that, that scale of, uh, of things. And of course, it is a story of intrigue and, and whatever. I might add that George Lehman, who became mayor of York and an MP, and uh, Sheriff became an MP for Worcester. And you might say, well, what's changed, you know? <laughs> and there he is. That's um, a sort of lithographic of uh, the great uh, George Lehman. And he, he rose to be eventually chairman of the Northeastern Railway, which was a very successful railway company. Here we're back at the scene of the magnetic ironstone deposit. This was a marshalling area for the tubs of ironstone. When they were pulled out of the mine, they were put into sets and connected with a hauling rope and hauled all the way up to the top. This is bank top. This is where they had to be hauled up to. And 1864, things were just nicely getting rolling along. And there was a young boy, John Hugill, 12 years of age, and his job was to connect up 
these tubs into rakes ready to be hauled up, up the incline. While he was working between a set of tubs, the rope broke up somewhere up here and a set of tubs, full tubs, rolled back, gathering speed and of course hit the tubs that little John Hugill was working on. And that was him. 20 minutes later, he died of his injuries. And all that would happen is, you know, a horse and cart would put him on uh, some straw and the horse and cart would take him back to his parents and that was it, you know, that was life in those days. So let's make our way now back up to Bank Top because we're, we're going further afield. So this is part of the incline, but it's, as you can see, it's, it's collapsed in parts and, and it's, it hardly bears any relation to what it would have looked like. Here we see spoil heaps and actually in, into the hillside here there was mining going on for the dogger, this so-called inferior ironstone that was extensively mined in, in Rosedale. So mining operations were still going on further along as well as the uh, drift mining of the magnetic stone. So let's uh, work our way steadily upwards. Here we can see a good section of the incline. That gives you an idea of what it would have looked like in its heyday. So that's a, a section that's withstood the test of time. And as we're on our way up to, the, uh, to Bank Top, if we look to the right, we see a sort of an outline as though there's been some sort of building uh, down there. This was known as High Row. It was a row of cottages built specially for the miners' accommodation. So let's go down and have a look at it. And here at floor level, so to speak, you can clearly see the evidence of where there's been a row of cottages. We don't unfortunately have any photographs of, of High Row, but as you'll see, we do have one of Low Row and they would be very similar. But before we get down there, just kicking around amongst the rubble, what do we see? One of these ranges. I forgot to look at the time, but almost certainly that would have been a product of the Relton foundry of Isaac Artas. All the cottages, all the railway cottages were equipped with Relton foundry ovens and ranges and whatever. And here we are at Low Row, 20 cottages for miners and um, we think we're fairly sure that High Row would be very similar. There's some debate about how many cottages were at High Row. Some say 17, some say 20, but it's round about that figure. Here's another shot of Low Row. And this farm here is still there, that building there. So we've got to the top of the incline. This is the Chimney Bank Road, the old mining company. Originally, they built that road. Here we see uh, a blocked up entrance. Clearly, that's been where the uh, tubs of ironstone would go underneath the road. So there we see the remains of the road bridge. And, and of course, the tubs of ironstone would pass underneath. I first got, because I was a, a newcomer to the area anyway, in 1960, but I first got interested in and visited Rosedale around about 1967, 68. And certainly this road bridge was there then. And this photograph I think was taken in early 1970s. So it was still there, um, but obviously that's all gone. Going back to that aerial photograph that we showed in part two, let's put that road bridge in context. There's the road bridge there, the tubs of ironstone passed underneath the road there, continued up here with the stationary hauling engine, steam driven hauling engine, somewhere there, at that point there. The tubs of ironstone then were marshaled and brought across the top of the kilns and emptied into the kilns along with a mixture of coal for the roasting process. So that, uh, that shows how it all fitted in with the incline. 
That thing there is the uh, man-made pond reservoir fed by uh, Moorland Springs for the feed water for the boilers that supplied the steam to the hauling engine, the stationary hauling engine here. Now, we told that the boilers were Collier design. I find it hard to believe, but I'm told they were vertical boilers. I, I do find that a little bit hard to, to believe that they would have vertical boilers on that site. Three in number, and each boiler had to be brought by special adapted wagons, drawn by, it is said, 40 horses per wagon with these boilers that weighed something like two and a half, three tonnes. And three were needed and were erected on the top here. As I say, vertical boilers in that location doesn't seem right, but uh, I don't have any evidence to refute it. So we'll, we'll just have to stay with it. Now, I went to the other side of the valley to take this photograph and the kilns are here and the railway cottages or what's left of them are there. But at this level here, there was also this mining operation going on, drift mines, um, small scale, but it was, it was the dogger. But also they were quarrying stone. The Rosedale sandstone was high quality and was much in demand. Remember in this period, 1860, 70, the railways were taking vast amounts of stone for railway bridges and railway stations. Docks and wharves, everywhere, harbours were expanding and um, docks and wharves were being built and sandstone was in big demand, especially good quality sandstone. So, of course, in a remote valley like Rosedale, you couldn't do much with it until the railway came. When the railway came, it's a godsend. You know, you've got the ready-made means of, of quarrying and shifting it to the places like Middlesbrough and Stockton and wherever. So this was also going on at the time. So this is an aerial view looking down on the Chimney Bank Road. And here, there's that terrace that we just saw from the opposite side of the valley. You can see it's a working terrace here. And that area there is almost certainly been a quarry area for quarry stone. And here we see a tramway, the route of a tramway. We think it was horse operated. It probably have a, a sort of like a, a turntable at the top and they'd have a horse that would be attached to the hauling rope and it would go around the turntable. The horse would walk downhill to pull the tubs or the wagons, whatever they were loading up, uh, up the hill. It could have been a horse gin, but I doubt it. It's probably more likely something more simple. Certainly the stone was being hauled up onto the railway side. This was the famous chimney on a uh, chimney bank. It was built by a stone mason called John Flintoff, who came from the village of Lastingham and it was a hundred feet high and it was said that when he'd finished, um, when he topped out, as they, as they term it, um, he danced on the parapet here. <laughs> and uh, this photograph was taken in 1936. It's on the back of a postcard that they have and it was taken in 1936. And it's interesting I think the postage was a halfpenny, and um, old halfpenny, old money, of course. And uh, the sender says on the on the card to whoever it's going to, "Do you know this place?" And uh, you know, it's it's quite interesting to think that you know this this person might not have even heard of it. Anyway, um, my interest in this was the chimney, of course, and the pond. Um, the reservoir, again, it's moorland streams feeding into the pond, the reservoir, for the feed water for the three boilers that fed the uh, hauling engine. And this was a photograph I took probably 10, 15 years ago of that same reservoir. 
still there, a little bit uh, overgrown. Another shot of the chimney. This was probably taken just before it was pulled down. The landowner wanted it down. He didn't want the responsibility, but there was a movement and it started in 1939. A group of people wanted it to be preserved and it would have been today. And they formed a little society to raise funds and everything for, for the chimney to be preserved. Now, after the war, World War II, this same group then started to resurrect and, you know, raise the idea again of preserving the chimney. And it was almost certain that the landowner got wind of this and hurried up his ideas and got the permission of the National Park. It wouldn't happen today. Got the permission of the National Park to pull it down. And it was pulled down in July 1972. And the stone fetched 360 pounds. And that monument, that icon that had been there for 150 years, that was well known, was a landmark for everybody knew, knew it, um, was destroyed. And, you know, as I say, it wouldn't happen again. Fortunately, we've got a chimney like that at Kildale, a failed mining venture but the chimney, the landowner has preserved it. And that's, you know, all credit to him. And it's now the subject of this heritage lottery funding, preservation and everything. So here we are at the kilns. Let's proceed a bit more. You can see they're in a desperate state of needing preservation. The crumbling rate has been rapid. And really you could say that the lottery grant, heritage lottery grant that will hopefully consolidate the remains, has come in just in the nick of time because another year, few years and there'll be no, nothing left. Here we see the lining of the kilns, which is this refractory brick, fire brick we'd call it. Of course, the temperature in there when they were calcining would be, we're guessing, around about five, 600 degrees centigrade. Unfortunately, there are no records left of how these things were operated. How did they get a balanced uh, heat across the bed the, the, when they were calcining the ironstone? You know, you don't want a temperature gradient. You want it as even as possible. How did they do that? What were the air ducting arrangements and things like that? How did they operate? We simply don't know. No records exist. But there appears to be some sort of venting system here. It's a, a sort of like a ducting, but it's, we're just guessing. Here we see some sort of a hook. We're not sure, we're just guessing again. Was there some sort of hood arrangement on a hinge system that they could raise and lower and probably hold back with a hook arrangement, this anchor bolt and uh, shaft there. Again, we're guessing. We simply don't know how they worked it. We don't know the date of this photograph taken of the bank top kilns. The caption says, calcining kilns thought to be bank top Rosedale West, undated. They are, they definitely are Rosedale West side kilns. Now, reason I can tell you that for certain is we know that they initially built four kilns and then rapidly found that that wasn't sufficient. So they added on another four. And if you look, you can see there's a clear line there. These are the new four. These were the original four. And the evidence is still there to this day. And there, there it is. So clearly these four kilns were added subsequently. So that photograph confirms it. Now, the height, the height of the kilns, I did a rough measurement when, when I physically could get into places like this, did a rough calculation, and it's somewhere around about 40 feet high. It is said that 
there was an incident where they were using a horse to pull loaded tubs of ironstone, must have been in sets, across the bit. They'd have a, a sort of rail arrangement across the top of the kilns where they could drop the, the ironstone and the coal for the uh, heating process, constantly feeding the top of the kilns from the top of the kilns. It is said that the horse spooked and fell into one of the kilns and they couldn't get it out. And of course, the kiln was operating. So, you know, I'll leave it to your imagination to think about that poor horse. We'll move on. Here we see a coaling operation. This is bank top engine shed. We see a coaling operation, a manually operated crane thing here. No engine power there. It's just winding it with a crank uh, and moving it around. What they're doing, they're taking coal out of this hopper truck up here into this bucket and then charging the tender of the locomotives. And we can see clearly on this locomotive the special tender screen that was fitted exclusively to the Rosedale locomotives because of the severe climate that could be experienced on the moors. The normal trains just had that. The crew, the crew protection was that, and that was it, full stop. But as I said earlier, remember these locomotives, 50% of the time they're travelling in reverse because it's single track working. So if it's a blinding snowstorm and the locomotive's travelling in reverse, you can imagine the exposure of the crew without this tender screen and they used to throw tar tarpaulin over the top. That was exclusive to Rosedale locomotives. There were five based on the moor top, and they were all modified like that. A view inside the engine shed looking out, obviously has been a heavy snowfall, uh, gives you some idea of you know, the conditions that they would experience in winter. And um, again, we see that jib of that coaling crane and the base for that coaling crane is still there. If you know what you're looking for, that's it. Still there. And the remaining four cottages, railway cottages, originally 16, four still left. And this charming photograph, this is the north end of the banktop railway cottages. Notice the sleeper wall here. This was to protect the gardens. The gardens were important to the families. I mean, the wages were extremely low, of course. And one way of supplementing their food was to have a garden and be able to grow vegetables and keep hens and stuff like that. And of course, perched on the moor top, like this was, bank top, very exposed to the climate, it was essential to build some sort of protective wall round the gardens. And of course, what better than uh, railway sleepers? Most railway men uh, kept pigs as well. It was all, you know, to supplement their, their food uh, supply. So we'll have another quick look at uh, what was going on at Banktop. When you walk down there today, it's hard to imagine, you know, the scene that would have been a, a very busy scene that you would have seen back in the 1860s, 70s, well, right into the you know, turn of the last century. And here we see one of the locomotives, a very clean locomo looking locomotive. I don't know if it's specially done for the photograph, but it certainly is clean. A damaged photograph, a damaged print, you know, but uh, it, we're thankful that we've uh, managed to find them. Now, we'll set off on the mineral train. We're heading up now to Blakey Junction. We're going to go around right to the top of the valley and come down the other side. So here we are on a mineral, mineral train, leaving Bank Top for Blakey Junction. And just look at the landscape. It's the landscape of the moon. There's no vegetation. You can imagine what the Rosedale Valley looked like in those days, you know, scarred and empty, desolate, and goodness knows what. I mean, 
<laughs> we look at the Rosedale Valley today and it's a beautiful valley. You can't imagine what it looked like in those days. There's been quarrying going on down here as well. And coal mining. There was extensive coal mining going on. More coal, a, a very poor quality coal, but nevertheless uh, extensively mined. Two miles out from either direction, from Blakey or from Banktop, uh, we come to the point, the watering hole at Sledge Shoe. It was Sledge Shoe Farm originally. It was just known as Sledge Shoe. And there was a water crane there for replenishing the boilers of the locomotives. And again, they've constructed on the moor top a reservoir um, fed by mountain streams. And the railwayman who was housed in what was the old farmhouse at Sledge his most important job, his most important job was to make sure that the moorland streams were kept clear and the water continued to flow into this pond. And second to that was looking after the rail track. But his main priority was making sure that a water supply was constantly feeding into these, th this pond. I can imagine in winter time, it must have been a nightmare with you know, the severe winters they had then, breaking ice and goodness knows what. And here we see another shot giving you a sort of view of the general landscape to see how it fitted into the landscape. Pretty high up, of course, and that head of pressure that was made sure that the water was under pressure enough to, you know, be able to uh, feed the boilers on the, on the locomotives. And there are ruins of the farmhouse still there. As I say, it was occupied by a railwoman whose main priority was making sure the streams were flowing into that, that, that reservoir. If you want to explore it, if you haven't walked on the Rosedale track bed, it's worth it because the views are great. Roughly two miles from either Banktop or Blakey, if you keep an eye open in the ditch, the drainage ditch, that's a recent construction, you'll see evidence, brick, bricks, you might find a bit of ironwork in there. And this was the location where the water crane was positioned that you know, was used to supply the locomotive boilers. If you're interested, once you've found this point here, if you look along, just along the track bed a bit, look up, <laughs> up the hillside as it were, you'll see there's a natural, it's not a clear thing, but you'll see there's a natural sort of route up onto the moor. And it, if you go up there, it's just a matter of wandering around a bit till you come across the reservoir. I didn't know it was there till I did that. Um, and uh, it it's just adds to the interest if you're doing a walk. So we're arriving at Blakey Junction. This was a photograph taken about 1928 by William Hayes. Um, many of the photographs that we have of the railway were taken by him. And Remember that there were seven cottages, all occupied by rail staff. The track curving off to the left is the one that goes under the road bridge on the Moor Road and then onto the incline top at Ingleby. The one curving off to the right is to the head, top of the valley and then down for the east side. Now, this spur line was constructed, the st construction started in 1864 and was completed by August 1865. So we'll go up there and see what there is to see. Here we see the blocked off route that went under the original road bridge. And we're going to head up here, which will take us to the top, the head of Rosedale, top of the valley. We haven't gone only a short distance and you'll see an engineered level, extensive engineered level, and this was a siding for trains either going down to the East Mines or coming up from the East Mines. They could park here. Remember, it's single track working, 
So, you know, there's a bit of shunting going on, uh, trains waiting before they could uh, enter the, the section and that sort of thing. And this was a, a, a parking area, a siding. Right, I've taken to the Tiger Moth again, and it's an aerial shot to give you some idea of the task of the railway navvies. Remember, they're digging. They're digging all this. They don't have any excavators or mechanical aids or anything. It's pick and shovel. And look at the terrain that they're working through. And they've got to construct a railway track through this to topography. Now here is where the River Severn has its origins. And of course, they had to build a, a very extensive embankment and make arrangements for the river to pass through the embankment. It's worth, again, it's worth walking that. It's, it's quite impressive. But let's go back a wee bit. Um, this was a water tower that fed the locomotives more often when they were coming up from the east side mines because they were really work they were on full boiler pressure and working their guts out to, to come up the inclines from east mines. And they'll probably be in need of replenishment by the time they got here. And so the water crane uh, was positioned here. Again, it's fed by moorland water streams into a pond and uh, giving a, a head of pressure to the system. Now, I took that photograph probably 10 years ago. It's in a parlor state, one good winter gale if this isn't stabilised, it'll blow this down and then there'll be nothing left at all. So it's a fairly high priority, this, to stabilise this remnant for the next winter gales because it must be on borrowed time at the moment. Had you been going through on this walk in the 80, in <laughs> 1950s and 60s, it would have got to that state of, of decay but it was recognised, very, very recognisable. On top of here would be sitting a, a cast iron water tank. When the railway scrappers moved in in uh, 1926 and started to dismantle the railway, of course, all this sort of stuff was dismantled. It was all part of the scrap. And uh, so that all these tanks would be... Uh, part of the scrap, and they left the buildings. No interest in, in knocking the buildings down. And uh, this is what you would have seen round about 1950, 60, even possibly 70. So here we are starting our route track around the embankment at the, at the top of the head of the valley. It curves right round, obviously. And this was what they constructed to allow the River Severn passage through. Of course, at that stage of its journey, it was still quite relatively a small uh, stream. But nevertheless, of course, with the drainage off the moors in heavy rainfall, it would be quite, quite a volume. And look at the construction. That will be at least 150 years old and sound as a pound. I mean, you know, stuff lasted then after they'd built it. It was well constructed and uh, didn't really need much maintenance, obviously. So we come to one of the bigger of the railway cuttings on the railway. The navvies, of course, dug these out by pick and shovel. Again, no mechanical aids at all. They could have done it that way because in 1840, some American engineer designed the, they called it the steam navvy. So it was a, a steam excavator, steam-driven powered excavator. It was said that it could do the work of 100 navvies uh, a day. It had a crew of two. It had the operator, driver, whatever you want to call him, and his assistant, who presumably stoked and attended to the water supply and everything. And then it needed about four navvies, four or six navvies, attendant to it, to um, move spoil and, and whatever. But nevertheless, in economic terms, it would have replaced between 70 
and 100 navvies. It became available in this country, or designs like it, became available in this country by certainly by the 1850s, but the navvies <laughs> didn't want to know, and they made sure that it didn't, oper didn't have any of these. And it wasn't until the 1870s that the steam navvies became used in Britain. And principally, it was the building of the Grand Central Railway uh, between Leicester and London, I think it is, around about 1870, where they started to use them in, in real number, 60 or 70 at a go. But at this point in time, and this photograph was taken in 1880 when they were building the coastline between Saltburn and Whitby. And, and this, was, this was one of the photographs that was taken at the time. Um, so 1880, um, they introduced them, but of course the Rosedale Railway had long since been built. So how did they do it? They did it this way. And when you study this photograph, it's very clever. It's very well worked out. What they do is they start by digging a narrow passageway through the hillside and they lay tracks. And then they're able to shunt open railway wagons along here and they're taking spoil off the top. And the thing is, they're throwing it downhill. They're not taking shovelfuls and throwing it uphill on into the wagons. They're throwing down. And you can work at twice the speed at that rate. And by doing it in this method, they could cover an amazing amount of uh, volume of, of spoil excavated in a day. And you can see that there's a, there's a real system operating here. The different levels that are being worked but the thing is that as they're gradually working down, they're throwing spoil into the tubs and not into the wagons, I should say, and not lifting it up. So it speeded the operation up. It was ergonomically much more sensible. This was a, an engraving of the building of one of the notable cuttings on the Birmingham to London Railway in the 1840s. And I mean, this is absolutely frightening how they operated here. What they did, they put sort of wooden inclines and nailed a few long planks together with a, a couple of supports underneath. And all these pulleys here had a horse attached to each one on the end of a rope. So the, the navvy, its barrow is filled with spoil and the barrow has the rope attached to it and at a signal, the horse is walked forward at the top and pulls this rope over a pulley at the top and pulls up the barrow with the navvy holding on to the handles. Now you can imagine, you know, it's muddy, it's wet, they're on wooden planks, it could slip off and some of the height, the height of some of these cuttings, I mean, imagine, you know, if he lost his footing at the top there and he, he falls down here. I mean, it's probably 50 feet or something like that. But that's how they did it. And when you're going through cuttings these days on trains, you really should think, you know, this is how they were doing it. And uh, it wasn't done with modern machinery. It was done, at, uh, you know, the fear of life and limb. So here's a map showing you we've gone round the top of the valley here and we're now approaching this cutting. Just before the cutting, there was an encampment built by the navvies for their accommodation. Turf huts. Uh, sometimes they were called sod huts. It literally, sods of earth built into walls with a bit of a roof over the top, stove in the middle, and a door and a window, or something like that. And these, these housed up to 15. Uh, mixed bachelor navvies, married, well, sort of married, because they didn't have a proper uh, marriage ceremony, and, and kids and animals and goodness knows what, all together in, in a building like this, you know. Uh, communal cooking, it was unbelievable, the conditions they lived in. So at Rosedale Head, they had that sort of a construction 
at that, roughly that point there. Here's um, a sketch map. Um, somebody did the sort of study of, of the area and sketched out the sites of these um, turf huts, sod huts, as they sometimes were called. Having seen the map, I went to see if I could find evidence. And there we are. You see the outline that's been the base of one of these turf huts. And so I walked the site. There were seven on that sketch map. And I walked the site round here. You see where it's located on this sort of sloping hillside, head of the valley. You can imagine what it's like in winter. So I, went, I walked around here and I found all seven. So that was a fact of life. They lived in sod huts while they were building the spur line to the East Mines. Now I've taken this long shot from the Moor Road because I want to show you this particular construction which was a nightmare for them. This is known as Reeking Gill and you can see it's a normal drainage point for the moor. So you can imagine in heavy snowfall where there's a sudden melt or heavy rainfall there's a lot of water coming off this moor into this Reeking Gill and then down this valley. Now what they had to do of course was build an embankment across here to get the line across to these mines. And as fast as they tried to build it, the water washed it away. They had three goes eventually on the third attempt. On two attempts, the two initial attempts, they got halfway constructed and the floods just took it away. Finally, they completed it and they had a, similar to the head of the valley, they had a culvert that did the job. And 2004, I was in that area and I went down to the other side to have a look. And I found that the culvert was almost blocked, subsidence and muck and stone and goodness knows what. And it was almost blocked. And I started trying to alert National Park about it. I told the landowner about it. I said, if it fully blocks and this fills up with water. This embankment wasn't designed as a dam. If it then gives way, there'll be an absolute torrent of water down this valley and it could do terrible damage. It could even take life. So I was really very concerned about it. It was still flowing at the time, but only just. Anyway, last year it blocked and it started to fill with water. And it was only with the heroic efforts of National Park volunteers and a contractor who was involved and Heritage Lottery funding that has got the job sorted out. And now the danger has been removed. But it was down to heroic efforts by, you know, volunteers and, and as I say, the lottery grant and everything. Otherwise, we could have been faced with a tragedy. Not only that, but if we wash that away, you've, the track bed is totally ruined. You know, your walk is ruined, everything. So it was important. But I'm pleased to say it's, it's up and running now. And everybody's aware now of the danger. Now, I'm on the, the east side where the, the water built. So you can imagine. And I'm not at the bottom there. The, the bottom is down here somewhere, but you can see, you know, it's a sizable construction and you can imagine if there's a head of water uh, up against pushing against this, this embankment, which wasn't designed to hold back water. You can imagine, you know, what a catastrophe it could be. Anyway, um, and this was a photograph I took at the time of the exit culvert at the uh, west side. And you can see it's starting to crumble. Uh, things are starting to get serious. Um, that's a shot taken inside the culvert uh, at Reeking Gill. And it gives you some idea. Quite big, you can walk in there. In fact, you could walk right through. So let's head on. We're heading now to the East Mines. 
It pays sometimes on these walks. And I'd walk past this point several times. It pays to look back sometimes because you can miss things so easily. And on this particular occasion, I picked up the signs of sleep, sleeper marks here. And clearly there'd been some sort of spur line here. And I looked at this area, which isn't obvious, and thought, what was the point of, what's the reason for that? So I climbed up the hillside and all was revealed. Here we see a loading dock. It's been constructed for the purpose of loading freestone, sandstone. It's been quarried up above on the hillside um, was the Nabskar Quarry. It operated for 10 years. And of course, obviously the railway was a godsend for that organisation as well. So they'd built this loading dock. So wagons were shunted into the loading dock, probably three or four, well, three perhaps, and three stone, sandstone, uh, was brought down from the quarry with horse and sledge. They usually had sledges, wooden sledges, and the slabs of stone would be lowered onto the sledge. The horses would pull, pull it downhill, and eventually they'd have some sort of, a bit like the coaling crane at the bank top, um, to lift the stone on, uh, onto the wagons. And of course, the railway did the rest. And that's often not taken into account in talking about how much traffic there was on the Rosedale Railway. You tend to think of it only as ironstone, but in actual fact, it would be significant quantities of, uh, of freestone. We're only guessing, but if a quarry is working for 10 years, it's shifting, it's digging out some quarry stone. And that was just one. There were a number of, of quarries working on the Rosedale Railway section. So it would be, it would be busy. So off we go, great walking if you've never done it. Pick a nice day and have a walk on it because the views are fantastic. And here we round in the curve and the vista is opening up and this is the track bed. This is the main running line here, this level here. That's the running line. So what on earth is this? This is an incline going up onto the hillside. So what's that all about? So we get a bit closer and we can see that this is properly engineered and it works its way up in a spiral fashion up onto the top. And it's known as the coal road. And it was simply to shunt wagons of coal up to a level where they could feed the calcining kilns on the east side. 1968, um, when I first found out about the Rosedale Valley, these were the remains of what is known as the Black Houses. Um, a couple of railway cottages, and in the far distance, of course, we can see what were termed the iron kilns, and then over here, the stone kilns. But we'll deal with this first. This, cottages were known as the black houses simply because the conditions out there were so severe that water penetration through wind pressure was a real problem and the only way they could protect was to tar the outside of the houses which was a very effective way of making them waterproof and uh, so of course they got the term the black houses but it was simply because they were tarred to uh, stop water ingress. Uh, that's another view. Uh, this is 1968. And there's a, an earlier view around about, I didn't take this, it's taken in the 1950s. And here you can clearly see, you know, it's been painted uh, with tar, it's black. And when I went round there, in 2004, that's all that's left. And since then, there's virtually nothing left. A couple of bricks. And that is, that is an indication of how fast 
these things are, are disappearing. And these kilns in the distance are very important. You know, they would, they're disappearing at a similar rate. And they're really of national importance. They haven't had the recognition up here that they should have had. If they'd been down south, they would have had it and money would have been spent. But I'm afraid we've been neglected. Not now, because we've managed to get this lottery grant. So hopefully these will be consolidated, you know, make sure they're still there in the future. While we're in this, passing along the track, heading towards the kilns, in 2004, yes, that, that would be it, these ruins of an old farmhouse were still evident. Uh, it was known as Highgill Farm. And it was important because it was utilised in the peak of the mining operation when accommodation was desperate, absolutely desperate. The village of Rosedale, at the time the, the mining discoveries were made, had a something in the order, I'm not going to be exact, but it was something in the order of 535 souls. By the time the mining operation had reached its peak, it was nearly 3,000. And mainly miners and assistants and, and associated laborers and whatever and of course accommodation was desperate in the uh, in the early stages cottages were being built but not fast enough so this old farmhouse was pressed into service and in 1968 that was what existed um, in its heyday it had housed single miners and it was truly said that because they were doing shift works, uh, the uh, mining operation was on a shift rotor system. It was truly said that the beds were never cold because as one miner went, got out to go on his shift, the, the miner off the last shift was climbing into his bed and that was how a tight accommodation was. But of course we've lost all this now because there's virtually nothing left now. It's gone. That photograph I showed you earlier of the ruins in 2004 there's virtually nothing left. And what's interesting here is the slate roof. Now, that farmhouse, when it was built, would either have a stone roof or it would be pan tiles. But of course, these are Welsh slate tiles and that only, wherever you see those, you know there's been a railway line somewhere near because it was the railway that brought the, the tiles from the Welsh slate. And, and it, it, didn't, it didn't exist before the railways, um, not up here anyway. The lintel over the door is interesting. It's an ornately carved ram's head and very ornately sort of done uh, carving round. And it was obviously nicked from uh, way back from Rosedale Abbey. Uh, Rosedale Abbey, of course, a ruin, and, and obviously nicked and uh, built into this farmhouse. But it's all gone. So, um, here we're arriving at the kilns, the first set of kilns anyway. On the top, cottages and workshops along the top there, and the mining level was that level, and of course that was the level that they could wheel out the ironstone onto the top of the kilns and charge the kilns with the ironstone and, and coal. That's the scene you'll see today. Had you been there in the 19, early 1920s, that's what you would have seen. And that photograph tells us so much. Remember the coal road I mentioned? There's two wagons on the top there. They've obviously come along at this level and they've come from that coal road that we saw earlier, and they're now perched on the top. And these wooden hoppers, these are coal hoppers, so they run them along the top of the hoppers and discharge their contents into these hoppers. They, in turn, get discharged into mining tubs and wheeled across the top of the kilns and dropped into the kilns as the fuel for the calcining kilns. So, it's all carefully worked out 
and uh, it operated, of course, for, you know, <laughs> 68 years. Also, what's interesting is we can see a locomotive uh, here. It's obviously getting steam up. And if we count the wagons that it's attached to it, we find there are eight wagons. Now, that was the load limit for trains pulling out of East Mines because of the incline. So the limit, hauling limit for them was eight loaded wagons plus a brake van. On the west side, the maximum load for the west side, because of a, a less severe gradient, uh, was 15 loaded wagons with a brake van. So it's very interesting, that photograph. And we can see also more information that it tells us is that the kilns are not operating. It's the 1920s, most certainly. Probably, it could have been, it could have been prior to World War I, but I doubt it. I think these were almost certainly taken after 1920. And we can see the kilns are not operating. The iron doors, massive iron doors, uh, still in position. The scrappers, of course, took those. Uh, we weigh hundreds of tons, I would think. And the reason the kilns aren't working is that the, this process out here was relatively inefficient. By 1865, the calcining kiln designed for operation at the blast furnace sites was a much more efficient system. In other words, it was able to feed hot calcined ore straight to the blast furnace, which meant there was a, a bonus there, energy, you know, heated stone instead of cold stone. But also, its fuel consumption was much, much better. On the kilns that the blast furnace designed, the Bory and Jez design of kiln, it was roughly um, 26 tonnes of ironstone to one tonne of coal distributed in some careful fashion. Here, it is claimed, and I don't believe it for one second, it's claimed that these kilns, sometimes called the new kilns, but not new kilns, they were built first. New design, uh, unique, one-off. These were not repeated anywhere else. These were a, a one-off design. That's why they're important as well. We don't know how they're operated, how they operated. That is going to be the source of a big study and investigation this year, I hope. It said, it's on the record somewhere, that these kilns operated at the efficiency that I've just quoted. In other words, 26 tonnes of ironstone roasted for one tonne of coal. I don't believe it for one second. It might be as good as one tonne of coal to 15 or 18 tonnes of ironstone. I'd, that's pushing it. These kilns, uh, and especially the stone kilns, you'd be lucky if you were getting 12 tonnes of ironstone to one tonne of coal. So there's a cost there, obviously, a heating cost, a fuel cost. But it had to be, in the early days, it had to be done simply because the efficient designs hadn't been developed by then. And it was necessary. One of the prime reasons for, for roasting the ironstone was to break it down. I mean, miners, when they hacked it out, there were massive chunks of, you know, one man could hardly lift them. And blast furnaces can't accept stone of that size. It has to be broken down. And one way of breaking it down was to heat it at five, six hundred degrees and it splits and it crumbles and it, it goes into smaller pieces. But also, of course, there's a chemical action where the heat drives off the carbonates and water, roughly eight to ten percent water, absorbed water in the ironstone. And then the rest is 20 percent, say, carbonates. So through the roasting process, you've lost a third of the waste. That waste is of no use whatsoever to the blast furnaces. You're paying carriage on it. If you send it as raw ironstone, you're paying carriage on it. So 
it had a benefit there in reducing freight costs. But probably the most important part was it broke the ironstone down to a manageable stage, a state where the blast furnaces could deal with it. Once the kiln system had been developed and the far more efficient system uh, at the blast furnace sites, these, these became redundant. And here, because it's so um, out of the way now, they've decided, forget the kilns, we'll just feed the raw ironstone into these open wagons. We don't need the iron hopper trucks because the raw ironstone obviously is cold. It's not coming out of the calcining kilns red hot. So we can, we can use open wagons and what they're doing is out of the mine, they're bringing the tubs of ironstone, raw ironstone. It's coming down this chute and then truck by truck, or wagon by wagon, I should say, uh, they're being moved along. There's a locomotive on the end there and it's moving them along and they're filling them in turn with raw ironstone and that's carted off. And this is 1920s. And of course, it's all dealt with at the, at the blast furnace sites. So from that photograph, you know, it, there's a lot of information there. This photograph, we think, was taken in the 1950s. Clearly the black houses still in a recognisable state. What I'm interested for you to see is this is a coal road. And there's been a landslip here, a massive landslip. Now, it almost certainly happened after the mines closed. But had it happened when the mines were running, this would have been a bit of a catastrophe because it's swept away a great section of the coal road. So there's the level and then the whole thing has just slipped. We can see part of it down here and, and all this rubble, the whole lot has just slipped down. And this was the problem with the Rosedale Railway particularly on the east side, particularly constant problems with land subsidence, erosion and that sort of thing. So it was a, it was a headache for them, but they managed and uh, hopefully this catastrophe <laughs> didn't happen in the operating days. We've reached the end of part three. Right. Mm -hmm.